Okay, so this is what you need to know for the Neural Impulse Essay. So, sorry about the snow, but this will give you some practice and you can watch it over and over again, I guess. So, um, let's go over the, the anatomy of a neuron, the parts that you need to know. So, this purple part is the cell body. Let me try to get, let's see. The purple part is the cell body. Let's see if I can draw on it. Nope, of course not. Purple part is the cell cell body. Okay, and on it are the dendrites. Okay, so the dendrites are like the fingers coming out. Those are where we're going to have receptors that are going to pick up the neurotransmitters. Okay, this long part is the axon. Okay, and the axon is the long, thin part, and that's how the signal is going to get um, transmitted down the neuron. At the base of the cell body, connecting the cell body and the axon, that's where we have the axon hillock. So the axon hillock is going to be an important structure when we talk about the function. Okay, the axon can be wrapped in myelin, and we call that the myelin sheath. Okay, the cells that make up the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system are called the neurolemnocytes. So neurolemnocytes, we used to call Schwann cells. Um, in between the Schwann cells, in between the myelin sheath, there are spaces, and those are called neurofibril nodes. Okay, so there's just spaces in between. We'll talk about their function in a minute. Okay, at the end of the axon, there, are, there can be one or there can be several synaptic bulbs, and that's how the information is going to be transmitted down the neuron. Okay, now let's talk about the segments and the channels. Okay, so we have functional segments. So the functional segments mean they have a certain job to do. Okay, so if we go here, let's make the color red. Okay, so the receptive segment okay, is made up of the dendrites and the cell body. They're going to receive the message from the other neuron that's coming in. Okay, on the receptive segment, we have sodium, potassium, and chloride, and they're, they're ligand-gated channels, and I didn't change the L here. In our book now, ligand-gated channels and chemically-gated channels are the same thing, so our book calls them chemically-gated channels. So CGCs, so that's what I have right over here. Um, so chemically-gated channels are also known as ligand-gated channels, so that means that you have to have a chemical that's going to bind to them and that's going to be the signal for those channels to open up. Okay, the initial segment is at the axon hillock. Okay, and that's where the information is going to be summed up, and we're going to decide whether the neural impulse is going to be sent or not. At the initial segment, we have sodium and potassium voltage voltage gated channels. Okay, so vo voltage gated channels we call VGCs. VGCs open when the electrical charge reaches a certain set point. Okay, the conductive segment is made up of the axon. Okay, so it's just the axon. And it has sodium voltage-gated channels and potassium voltage-gated channels. Okay, so the same thing as the initial segment, got the same kind of channels. Okay, the transmissive segment is at the synaptic bulb. And the transmissive segment contains calcium voltage-gated channels and calcium pumps, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Okay, so those are the four functional segments, okay, and those are the channels that are found in the specific segments. Okay, now, when the neuron is at rest, it has what we call resting membrane potential. So the resting membrane potential of a neuron is negative 70 millivolts. This potential is maintained by sodium and potassium pumps and sodium and potassium leak channels. Okay, so the sodium and potassium pumps are going to pump three sodiums out for every two potassiums that go in. So that makes the inside of the cell more negative, okay, so see my little negatives, in comparison to the outside of the cell. Okay, so it's negatively charged, so that's where we come up with that negative 70 millivolts. There are a couple other things that contribute to that, but the big thing is the sodium potassium pumps and sodium potassium leak channels. Okay, leak channels are channels that are open all the time. Um, when they're open, 
they're going to allow sodium and potassium to travel down their concentration gradients. They're not making a big difference in the charge. Okay, they're not changing the resting membrane potential, but they're just trying to um, keep the neuron in homeostasis. Okay, so sodium potassium pumps and sodium potassium leak channels are all over the neurons. Okay, so they're everywhere. Okay, now we talked about this in lecture already, but let's go ahead and touch on it again. When we talk about how an impulse is transmitted, we're talking about a chain of neurons. So it's not just one neuron taking the information from your brain down to the muscle in your leg. It can be groups or several neurons linked together that are communicating together. So the first neuron, okay, so here's a neuron. It's just like a schematic of it. So here's the cell body, here's the axon, and here's the synapse is the little triangle. Okay, the first neuron we call the presynaptic neuron because it's before the synapse. Okay, so the synapse is the place where the synaptic bulb and the dendrites meet. Okay, and they don't touch, but there's they're space in between them, but they're close together. Okay, so that's the synapse. So the presynaptic neuron is before it, and the postsynaptic neuron is after it. So that makes, makes sense, right? It's pretty straightforward. Okay, now, the receptive segment. So I wrote up here, okay, so this is where, let's see, I don't know what, if this is making it better or not. Okay, so this is where, whoops, sorry, this is where the neurotransmitters that are being released from the presynaptic neuron are going to be released, and they're going to bind to the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, and they're going to bind in the receptive segment, so they're going to bind on the dendrites or on the cell body. Okay, so I didn't draw the whole neuron out. I just drew the top part. Okay, so here's my here's my presynaptic neuron. Okay, and in here there are vesicles. Okay, that's the little yellow things. And the vesicles have neurotransmitters in them. When they receive a signal, when their action potential comes down to the synaptic bulb, these vesicles are going to bind to the plasma membrane and they're going to exocytose the neurotransmitters out and into the synaptic cleft. Okay, so the neurotransmitters will be found in this space. Okay, now there's two different kinds of neurotransmitters. There's some that are excitatory and there's some that are inhibitory. Okay, if an excitatory neurotransmitter is released, it comes down and it binds to a cation chemically gated channel. Okay, so that's what fits. Okay, so it's a kind of a shape thing. So excitatory bind to cation chemically gated channels. Okay, and they cause those to open. Okay, cation chemically gated channels allow sodium and potassium to enter the cell. And sodium to enter the cell, potassium to leave the cell. Okay, because they're going to move down their ca concentration gradients. And we have more sodium inside the cell than we have more sodium outside the cell and more potassium inside the cell. Okay, so sodium is going to move in, potassium is going to move out, but way more sodium enters the cell than potassium leaves the cell. So it's really sodium that's making the difference. Okay, when sodium enters the cell, it makes the inside of the cell more positive. Okay, we call this change in charge, making it more positive, excitatory postsynaptic potential. And we abbreviate that EPSP. Okay, so an excitatory neuro neurotransmitter binds to a cation chemically gated channel, causes it to open, and it makes the inside of the cell more positive. Inhibitory neurotransmitters they bind to potassium chemically gated channels or they bind to chloride chemically gated channels. As an end result, what they're going to do is they're going to make the inside of the cell more negative. Okay, and we call that inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Okay, so they're keeping it negative. So if potassium if a negative neurotransmitter comes, it binds to the potassium. Okay, so pretend I'm drawing it on here. Binds to a potassium chemically gated channel. Potassium 
levels are higher in the cell, so potassium is going to leave the cell. Okay, there are other inhibitory neurotransmitters that bind to chloride, chemically gated channels. Chloride is higher outside the cell, and they're going to cause chloride to enter the cell. Okay, so we're going to have make the inside of the cell more negative. Does that make sense? So we're, we're either adding chloride ions, which are negative, so it's going to make it more negative, or we're adding, we're letting potassium ions leave, so we're taking positives out. So both ways it makes it more negative. And that's inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Okay, so when a neuron is just sitting here, okay, it's getting lots of signals all the time. So it's getting excitatory neurotransmitters binding to it. We're getting inhibitory neurotransmitters binding to it. So what we have to do is we're going to take these EPSPs and the IPSPs and we're going to add them up and we're going to see if we hit a certain number. And that certain number is called a threshold. Okay, so the initial segment is where we're going to sum them up. We're going to add up the IPSPs and the EPSPs, and we're going to try to hit a certain number. Okay, so let me see if I can draw an eye. I'm going to add up the IPSPs. Yeah, I'm doing this with the mouse, guys. And the EPSPs. And we're going to try to get what we call threshold. Okay, so if we hit a threshold, and the threshold is negative 55, Okay, so if I go down here, I have threshold. If we reach the threshold of negative 55, the neuron's going to fire. Okay, so the impulse is going to travel down. Okay, so we have to take the, the excitatory and the inhibitory, and we add them up. Okay, so if we make the inside of the neuron more positive until it reaches negative 55, that's the trigger for the sodium voltage-gated channels to enter or to open. Okay, so that's the hint, that's the time, that's the key for the VGCs to open. Okay, and what's going to happen is then sodium, right, it's higher outside the cell than it is inside the cell, is going to enter the cell, make it more positive, okay, and potassium is going to leave the cell and that's going to make it more negative and then we'll get back to where we're supposed to be. Okay, but the whole point of the initial segment is to sum up, to add up the IPSPs and the EPSPs. Okay, so here's what I have written. So at the axon hillock, the postsynaptic potentials will be summed. If the sum of the IPSPs and the EPSPs changes the resting membrane potential from negative 70 millivolts to negative 55 millivolts, then the action potential will occur. So action potential is going to be the change in charge that's going to go all the way down the neuron. Okay, one neuron can receive information from many different presynaptic neurons at one time. Okay, so there's different kinds of summation depending on how this neuron is getting the signals. Okay, we're in, that's on my next slide. Okay, so if we hit negative 55, everything goes. Okay, so it's not like, oh, you only hit negative 56 or, you know, negative 60. You hit negative 55, everything goes, and that's called the all or none law. So if you hit negative 55, you're going to get an action potential. Okay, now, there's two types, two ways we can sum this information up, sum up our um, postsynaptic potentials. So one way is called temporal summation and temporal is time okay so we can sum up over time so if you look here so here's here's a neuron a presynaptic neuron here's another one and here's another one okay one presynaptic neuron is sending a signal over and over and over again to the postsynaptic neuron and that's where the postsynaptic potentials are coming from so it's one sending it sending the information over and over and over again and uh, kind of almost like nagging it until it reaches threshold and it reaches the act and then the action potential goes so I always think of it as like one of my kids okay so if I'm 
you know, he wants me to make him dinner or make him a snack or whatever. So here I am sitting here on the pre the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, and he's just bugging me, mom, 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 mom. So it's just one of them, but he's doing it over time. And when all of that accumulates, then I'll get, I'll hit threshold, and then I'll get up and I'll make him a snack. Okay, now the other way that you can sum it up is spatial. And spatial just means over space. Okay, so what happens for spatial is that, um, there's more than one presynaptic neuron, so one, two, three, and all three of them are sending the signal. Okay, so my son and all of his friends are over, and they're all, but one of them saying, can I have a snack? The next one says, can I have a snack? The next one says, can I have a snack? So it's coming from several different ones, and it's going to cause the same effect. Eventually, I'm going to reach my threshold, and I'm going to get up, and I'm going to make him a snack. So that's summation. It occurs in the axon hillock. Okay, I'm going to stop this one and then make another video so that they're not too long.